So we're going to move on to talk about common pathologies that we'll see on a chest x-ray. The number one, well, anecdotally, but from my experience, number one pathology that chest x-rays are requested for, infection. So infection can look like many different things, but you know what we instantly kind of think of is these big areas of um, low bar pneumonia. So we've got, you know, dense consolidation. So the, the air spaces are filled up with um, material. You know, uh, this could be, you know, fluid, pus, you know, in the context of infection, but, you know, it can also be uh, blood. Here we can see that we've got a, a low bar pneumonia in the right upper lobe because it sits you know, superior to the minor fissure. So we, we know that that's therefore in the upper lobe. Similarly, this here is in the middle lobe because it sits inferiorly, doesn't cross the, the minor fissure. Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure how well that, this is going to project, but we can still see some right heart border here. Um, very, very difficult to see. So because we're obscuring that you know, it, we know that this is in the right middle lobe. We can also describe it as in in the context of zonal of infection or pneumonia. So we've we've got consolidation throughout the right mid to lower zone and left lower zone here. We've got some uh, it's slightly denser appearance here and some more patchy infiltrates. Um, so it's, it's all about how we describe its appearance as well as its location. Um, and here we can see that we've got air bronchograms running through the uh, the consolidation. So not only do we have the consolidation, but we can see gas-filled bronchi surrounded by the um, infiltrated alveoli. So whether it be a fluid pulse or the material. Um, it is very useful sign to to note because it is highly sensitive and specific for the presence of consolidation rather than collapse. It's a really good representation of air within the bronchi and then the consolidated lung around it. So we would describe this as, as a complete whiteout of the left lung with air bronchograms consistent with consolidation. There is some further patchy shadowing throughout the right lung but not that kind of dense um, low bar pneumonic appearance. So you will have heard me use the term consolidation. So we use the term consolidation to describe um, the alveolar and the small airways that are filled with dense material, so not air. Um, so, so therefore we say the lung is consolidated. Um, again, doesn't always mean infection. Um, it, it can be fluid, so in the case of pulmonary edema, blood from hemorrhage, or it can be um, filled with cells due to cancer. But in, in the terms of infection, you know, um, we'll use the term consolidation to describe that pneumonic appearance. Another common uh, request for chest x-ray is for the assessment of cardiac failure. Um, so there are stages to the kind of imaging manifestations of, of heart failure or congestive heart failure. Um, and we're gonna, we go through through those step by step. But in general, general terms, the heart is enlarged. We've talked about the cardiothoracic ratio, um, but then we can look for other features of, of failure. Um, including things such as upper lobe vessel enlargement, signs of pulmonary edema, pleural effusion. But also taking on what we've talked about previously, we need to take into consideration those technical factors. So is the heart enlarged because it's true enlargement that we're seeing on a PA projection, or could it possibly be due to the technical factors that we've already discussed? So as well as the cardiothoracic ratio, which is the initial kind of assessment for cardiac enlargement. Um, we can look for um, upper zone vessel enlargement, or sometimes you'll hear it described as upper lobe uh, redistribution. 
Um, this is a sign of uh, pulmonary venous hypertension. Normally the vessels um, are the upper lobe vessels. Let me find a good representation. And the, the upper lobe vessels are usually um, not as prominent. Um, it's largely due to the act of gravity on the lower lobe vessels. Um, so they're more prominent. In a case of um, upper lobe diversion, or you know, in, when we're thinking about um, upper lobe pulmonary venous diversion, um, also you might see the term um, cephalization. Um, so it's uh, it reflects elevation of the left atrial pressure. Um, and you can see that these vessels are much more prominent than on so this chest x-ray. So the heart's having to work harder. We've got um, that sign of pulmonary venous hypertension. So it's much more prominent and working against gravity. So that's another key indicator. Um, here at number two, we can be, and there's going to be some more representations of this later on. Um, we've got uh, septal lines, also known as curly B lines. Lots of things in radiology are named after the people that first described them. Um, so this is a sign of, of interstitial edema, um, which we'll um, also see in, on the, the next picture, the next slide slightly more, more prominently. Um, Number three, we've got some airspace shadowing. Predominantly in cardiac failure, you'll see this in the perihilar regions, um, sometimes described as a, a, a bat swing distribution. And again, we'll have some more graphical representation of that shortly. Um, and this is due to alveolar edema. So where um, you know, not only have you gone to uh, the point where you're the interstitial shadowing um, on a chest X-ray gets to the point where the, the tissue can no longer um, uh, And patients in cardiac failure can also develop pleural effusions. So putting all this together, we can you know, create a picture of cardiac failure from the, from the appearances on the chest X-ray. So we've just got a couple of graphical representations. So looking at you know, left ventricular enlargement here, so we've got a uh, larger or a uh, uh, higher than um, average cardiothoracic ratio and again another we, we are although this is an AP projection we can also see that there's a more globular part here so we've got um, left ventricular and left atrial, atrial enlargement there are other other signs on here that we can also see we see a, a, a denser material on the left here, showing a, a calcified left ventricular aneurysm. We've got some other examples. Uh, this is a side-by-side -side of previous films we've seen about upper lobe diversion. Got some slightly more prominent um, images coming up of these curly B lines, these interstitial septal lines. So seen within the periphery of the lower zone, usually in the costophrenic angle, um, septal lines caused by thickening of the interlobular septa, which separate the secondary lobules at the periphery of the lung. They can be quite subtle, but if they're seen in the context of a clinical suspicion of cardiac failure, then you know, septal lines are a strong indicator of, of interstitial edema, which can then lead to full-on alveolar edema. Lots of slides demonstrating things that we've already discussed. Um, so pulmonary edema um, is quite a, a striking manifestation of um, cardiac failure. And we've described these perihilar infiltrates, the perihilar airspace pacification, um, sometimes described as a bat wing sign. There's lots of things in radiology that are like are described as signs. You, related to a, a name. And I never really got bat wing sign until someone described it looking like the Batman sign rather than bat wing sign. And I actually get it. 
if we imagine that this is the, the mediastinum and then we've got these areas of consolidation around it. I don't know if any of you are convinced. It took me a while to, to be able to see it, but the first time I saw it in, uh, in context of the Batman sign, um, it made more sense. And also, it's been an excuse for me to put the Batman sign in the presentation, so that'll do for me. Another really common pathology seen on chest x-rays is the pleural effusion. And this is the um, you know, accumulation of fluid within the pleural space. Um, so uh, let me get a better picture up shortly, just a graphical representation. So I'm sure as you're all likely aware, we've got the um, parietal pleura and the visceral pleura, which the outer layer, um, the parietal pleura attaches to the chest wall and the inner layer um, covers the lungs and the vessels and the bronchi. Um, and then we have the pleural cavity or the pleural space, um, which you know, pleural effusion is fluid between, like in the pleural space. So on a chest x-ray, we can assess that there is an abnormality here because we have white where it shouldn't be. The right hemithorax here looks very normal. You know, we've got lung markings all the way down to the diaphragmatic dome and the costophrenic angle, but whoop, we've got a big white area. So it's white, it's not air. It's going to be fluid or something like that. We've also got a meniscus, so we've got this up, this lipping at the edge, it's likely fluid. Um, so there's an accumulation of fluid within the, the pleural space. It can be um, seen in, in a lot of different kind of clinical scenarios, so it's not pathognomonic to a single like disease process. Um, in the context of cardiac failure, you know, it, it would um, almost certainly be bilateral, unilateral, you're more thinking um, you know, malignancy, uh, a paranemonic para effusion, so uh, related to an infection. Um, it could, they, they can become quite loculated um, if, if it's due to a, uh, if, if there's um, gas locules in there, then you're thinking uh, an empyema. Um, and you also have to think that this is taking up space within um, in the thoracic cage. So, you know, there's a finite amount of space in there. So you know, we're getting here, we can get some tracheal deviation to the right and some ipsilateral mediastinal shift um, because this, you know, all this fluid is taking up space where other anatomy should be. So that's a really good indicator that actually it's, it's, it's a volume of something. And in this case, we can see again, the um, loculation of the chest wall. If it was, collapse which we've seen previously or consolidation filling up the airways um we or certainly collapse we would see some volume loss whereas here we've got an increase in something um taking up space the very common pathology being pneumothorax so this is you know, a collapsed lung or air within the thoracic cage where it shouldn't be i mean this is from a ct um, scout, but we can see you know, very abnormal left hemithorax with you know, pretty much complete collapse of the left lung. They can be on you know, the chest x-ray, very, very obvious. So we've, we've got the pleural edge, the visceral pleural edge, and then nothing in between. And let me see if I can project that a little bit better for you. Here we go. So again, pleural edge. We can see that there are no lung markings here, all the way down here. This is all air. So again, an abnormality that we can spot, and then we can make an assumption because of our prior knowledge. Right hemithorax looks very normal. Let's see if I can find a slightly more subtle one. Please ignore this image, this is a very old one. Um, so we've got a much more subtle pneumothorax here. Again, no lung markings. Don't know how well this is projecting, but we can see you know, a visceral, uh, the pleural edge. And they can be very hard to see, and you know, they can almost track the, the either the superior or the inferior aspect of the rib, and you, know, you have to be really, really careful 
zoom right in and have a have a good look. You may see or read um, pneumothorace is being described um, either as a, a primary spontaneous, so like there's no underlying lung disease, um, a secondary spontaneous, so there's underlying lung disease present, or um, a uh, traumatic, so there's, there's been trauma to the thorax, which has caused um, the pneumothorax. Another very common uh, radiographic uh, pathology or you know, um, sign of pathology is pneumoperitoneum. We get so many requests for uh, chest x-ray query perforation. Um, it's a pneumoperitoneum obviously describing gas within the peritoneal cavity. Um, outside of the context of like a post-surgical appearance, um, this is a sign of a usually a critical illness. Um, PA chest x-ray, well, erect chest x-ray, um, as in the patient sitting up rather than being supine. Um, probably the most sensitive um, plane radiograph for the detection of free air. Um, and we see that in the subdiaphragmatic region. So you, air, we have the patient sat up in the, I'm waiting for the x-ray, whether it be in your department or in the x-ray department, usually for about 10 minutes. Um, and any free air within the um, peritoneal cavity will percolate up through the abdomen and sit under the diaphragm. Um, we wouldn't assess for free air, as I said previously, underneath the left diaphragm, um, because that's where the gastric ball sits, but we shouldn't ever see free air or free gas below the right hemidiaphragm. That being said, Sometimes we do see a crescent of air, but actually there are some very subtle bowel markings, some haustral folds. Um, and this is a sign called, and I pronounced this incorrectly for quite a while, called Kyloditi syndrome, Kyloditi syndrome. Um, and this refers to usually an asymptomatic interposition of bowel below the right hemidiaphragm. Um, it's usually the hepatic flexure and it'll sit between the liver and the right hemidiaphragm. Um, it, incidentally, more frequent in males, um, almost always in adults. Um, and it also can be intermittent. But here, let me again see if I can zoom in. Whereas previously we saw complete, that's if I could use the controls properly. You can see that there's lung markings there and just air below the diaphragm on these examples here. I hope you can see that there are actually bowel markings. So it's not free air, it's just an interposition of bowel loop. And before we move on, another common appearance, usually within the older population, um, are pleural plaques or calcified pleural plaques. So pleural plaques are the most common manifestation of asbestos related disease. Um, strong a correlation or association with in, inhalation of asbestos fibers um, an extremely long latency typically about 20 to 30 years after the onset of exposure um, it used to be thought of as a as a an, an elderly gentleman's condition um, you know asbestos having primarily been used in construction and the kind of uh, machinery environments um, but increasingly seen in women who would then wash the clothes of the men, which are covered in asbestos um, fibers. So it's, it's you know, not, not just thought of as a, as a male prevalent uh, disease. Um, you know, and, you know, anecdotally seen in populations from less developed countries as well, we obviously over um, in, in Europe, there's been a, a a widespread ban on the use of asbestos um, and, and strict controls over its disposal 
whereas in other parts of the world less so so it can be seen in younger patients but again there is that long latency um, of, of 20 to 30 years I'm going to move on to tubes, lines and devices, but I'm going to be brief. I fully aware that it's an afternoon session and I've been droning on about chest x-rays for over an hour. Um, so another common um, cause for patients to come for uh, chest x-rays to assess for positions of you know, medical devices that have been inserted into the patient, whether that be chest drains, um, CVC lines, um, CVP lines. Um, here we can see a right internal jugular central line the tip is you know over the svc um that is not a very good radiograph oh no not a very good copy of a radiograph we've got a longer line um but you know, we should um reach the medial end of the clavicle before descending um should descend descend laterally to the spine and the tip should be distal to the anterior end of the fifth rib so it's usually around the uh, around the level of the carina or just beyond at the cavoatrial junction. Sometimes they can be seen descending as far as the um, overlying the right atrium. Um, I tend not to make any particular judgment from a radiographer reporting perspective as to the adequacy of the position. I'll just describe where it is. Um, yeah, I think I feel that that's more for the clinician who's you know, inserted it and using it to decide whereabouts um, they've uh, deemed to be satisfactory. However, if it's in an inappropriate position, so if it crosses over and it might be seen in the um, left um, innominate region or something like that, or if it's um, turned cranially and extended up into uh, or on itself back up into the um, internal jugular region, then I shall make a, an assessment that it's inappropriately positioned in that case. Um, as I say, common misplacements, right atrium or internal jugular vein, however, you do see them being used um, when they're positioned over the right atrium. Um, pacemakers, another you know, common reason for um, patients to be sent to assess for pacemaker position. Oh God, they're rubbish. X-rays, one second. So here we can see a much better image um, and then an annotated version. So we've got the uh, pacing box or the pulse generator, and we've got a, an atrial lead um, and a ventricular lead, but was, we can get um, triple lead pacemakers where we have another lead going over the coronary sinus. Um, it's important to know the difference between um, a pacemaker and um, a, an internal um, defibrillator, so our CRTD such as this one, so as well as having an, an atrial lead, a lead over the coronary sinus, we also have um, a different lead here, um, a ventricular lead, and this thicker area denotes that it's a uh, resynchronation device. ET tube placement, again, another, um, this is you know, either cone down or it's a, a C-spine projection, but you know, they have a, a radiopaque marker should be about three to five centimeters above the carina, um, which is you know, should be roughly halfway between the medial end of the clavicle. Again, we just we've talked about um, that showing well a good good positioning of the patient um, and them not being rotated. Um, but if we if we are seeing some tracheal deviation, is it due to positioning? And we can look at the other anatomical structures, or is it because we've got something like a retrosternal thyroid goiter that might be taking up space and pushing that trachea over? Misplaced ET tubes can cause certain um, it, you know, complications here. This looks to have been pulled back slightly, but we can see that there is um, a pacification in the right upper lobe. Um, so if the tip does descend down the um, right main bronchus, we can occlude um, airway to some of the lobes of the lung. Um, so we've got some atelectasis in the right upper lobe. Um, there and, and some volume loss. We can see that the minor fissure has been pulled up. So placement of the nasogastric feeding tube or NG tube is another common reason for um, patients to come for a chest x-ray. Um, we can see here that the uh, NG tube you know, passes down and bisects the carina. 
it passes the diaphragm, we can see the tip projected overlying the stomach. So this tells us that this is a satisfactory uh, placement and it's safe to use. We need to ensure that we can see the tip to make sure that it's in a satisfactory position. Um, most tubes are visible um, without the guide wire, but you know it's really helpful to keep the guide wire in if possible when sending for an, an x-ray because it's it's radio opaque and we can see it really easily. Um, and here, just in case anyone's struggling to see that, we can see the graphical representation. Um, and obviously we can have misplaced NG tubes that can enter the airway and that's you know, classed as a, uh, a never event. If we then uh, use those uh, and, and feed into the lung, so it's obviously critical that we ensure that they are correctly placed or if not correctly placed, removed immediately. So here we can see a misplaced NG tube. We can see the tube, um, it doesn't bisect the carina, it passes down the left main bronchus and it extends. And although the tip is projected below the diaphragm, it's not in the midline. And we can say that that tip is in the left lung base and that needs to be removed immediately. So it's usually at this point that I round things off and we can have um, just a, a little thought of what have we discussed. So we set out to be aware of the normal appearances on a chest radiograph. I think we've done that. And we wanted to gain some understanding of the complexities of image interpretation. And I think we've, we've, we've done that as well. And then acquire some visual experience with radiographic images, which I think, I think we've done there. Um, I'm going to just close the PowerPoint now and just go through a couple of um, chest x-rays just to view them from a context of image interpretation using some of the principles that we've just discussed. Um, and then I shall leave you to the rest of your day. Um, this is also the point where I normally ask if there are any questions, um, but obviously I'm I'm not live. So please, if anyone does have any questions or has found any of this interesting or wants some, um, you know, some further um, reading or or just for any reason to contact me, please feel free to forward any questions or anything like that onto um, either Alan or or. Uh, your lecturers and they can they can forward this on to me i'm quite happy to to discuss x-rays with people um as as much as as much as you want so uh one second so we're going to look at a few interesting chest x-rays now so I'm, I'm hoping that after um what we've just discussed that everyone can instantly see that we have a lot of abnormalities on this on this chest x-ray so first of all, where do we start? Well, let's pretend we've got the correct patient and it's the correct image that we should be looking at. We've been told that it's AP erect, so we can't make any assessment on cardiac size. And why can't we do that? Well, because of the intrinsic enlargement due to the AP projection. We've got a correct anatomical marker. So where, where else are we looking? Well, instantly we can see there is lots of lucency in these soft tissues. We would normally expect soft tissues to be. So we can instantly see that there are a lot of abnormalities on this chest x-ray. Um, we have subcutaneous emphysema or surgical emphysema in the soft tissues of the neck going down into the chest wall. We have a, a pneumothorax on the right here, this we are no longer seeing the lung markings go all the way to the edge of the thoracic cage. And we've got a, a pleural edge there. We also have another one here. And we've got these lucencies running down the mediastinum. Um, so we also have a degree of pneumomediastinum as well. Um, and we can see some air, some lucency, sorry, around the outline of the heart. we've got the suggestion of a pneumopericardium as well. We've got some overlying artifacts. So we've got all these more than likely either a hospital gown or, or possibly blanket or sheet. Um, but we, we haven't got normal lungs. A degree of this may be due to the pneumothorax, but we can also see some infiltrates in the lung bases. Um, so 
a lot going on here, but I'm, I'm sure that you can all see that there are you know, abnormalities, even if you weren't incredibly confident with chest x-rays before this presentation. And again, I'd hope that instantly we can recognize that there is um, an abnormality. We can see that there is a complete collapse of the right lung. Um, we can see there's no lung markings whatsoever. We've got air throughout this hemithorax. And there is the impression of some slight mediastinal shift to the left. So this could um, demonstrate a, what's called a tension pneumothorax. Um, so this occurs when you know, interpleural air accumulates progressively and you know, increases the pressure um, on the tension within the uh, within the thorax. It's life threatening. You should never really see X-rays of it because you can make a clinical diagnosis, but we inevitably do. So this is this is a medical emergency. Um, we can also see that there is some slight increase in the um, spaces between the ribs. And it's, it's quite subtle, but again, that's just showing us that there's an increased tension within that um, hemithorax. So how are we going to interpret this? Again, not normal. We can see that we're AP erect and we've got the added complication that it's mobile. Um, often this does mean that sometimes um, some areas of anatomy are not present so we've, we've just cut off the costophrenic angle there um less so of an excuse these days as most mobile machines are portable but obviously in the context of you know, the critically ill patient we don't always have the time to then repeat the chest x-ray if other health professionals are um uh, caring for the patient but what can we infer from this well it is ap it's we've got the clavicles they're equidistant, so we're not too rotated, but they are quite high, so this might mean that there's an, uh, an element of lordosis. So we've got this increased interstitial pattern throughout both um, the left and the right lung. And uh, I was trying to zoom in. There we go. Sorry, stop being clever. Here we can see the um, septal lines or the curly B lines that we were um, talking about with cardiac failure. So we've got perihilar airspace pacification. We've got increased interstitial shadowing in septal lines. The appearances are favoring um, either a cardiac failure or pulmonary edema. And lastly, a very suboptimal, very abnormal chest X-ray. Very little that we can um, infer from this. However, we can see here that there is multiple or numerous metallic radiopic foreign bodies, and this particular image is uh, consistent with a shotgun injury. So I will draw to a close, and thank you all for listening. As I said previously, any questions, please feel free to forward them on to me. Um, and I wish you all the very best in your continued studies. Thank you very much.